global communication protocol, very simple, um, but slow. You know, it's a very old protocol. If you look at the timing diagram, it's just so super simple. Sending bytes. Okay. And because this is just a one line, if you have a TX, drop paper. There are two device, two, uh, two devices, and uh, this is RX, this is TX. <clears throat> So when you make the connections, you should do this, right? If this is Arduino, for example, Uno, this is a sensor. Transmitter should be connected to the receiver, and the receiver should uh, receiver should be connected to the transmitter uh, of the the other device. Right? And there's only one line. One line means you can only hold one bit for each line. So I have to do serial. That's why it's called a serial communication. A lot of times UART, they use UART or serial interchangeably, uh, but there are so many other protocols that are also serial, just one line, like I2C and SPI as well. They're, they're all serial, but a lot of times the general term of serial is usually referred to UART, because probably because this is the first uh, serial communication protocol was available a long time ago. Um, if this is TX, for example, if you look at this diagram, so TX, TX here is shorted to RX. When you want to tell the the follower that you want to start the communication, you have to pull it down to ground first. So the first bit will be a starting bit, which is a zero. You have to pull it down first to show that. Uh, to tell the follower that you want to start a communication and then followed by data it could be zero or ones d0 to d7 that's one byte and followed by a parity bit where i learn what the parity bit is and then put it up to one to finish the transmission of one byte pretty simple right put it down first so the transmitter put it down first and then send the data including the parity bit, and pull it up. So if you look at the, the code here, the TX uh, port need a logic control. It's a, it's a digital block. So if you look at the digital block, what we need here, including a clock, a send bit, a write bit as the output, and that's a TX, which is just the one one wire, one bit, right? Because this is a uh, serial communication. So the data is uh, a bit data and clock depends on how fast you want to run it. And send is whenever the data is ready, you put a send, uh, give a one to send. So you are able to send all the serial bits through the this one line and write it means you are ready to send another byte it's just the one one bit here as well so these are all the inputs and outputs for this digital block so the um, the places that you need to notice is for example here you have a few actually it's three different states ready rdy right rdy low bit send bit um, so during the write state, it just reset everything here first, and when sent, so this is important to see, okay? There's, I know there are a couple of lines, this can be confused if you're not familiar with it, but there are a couple of pretty critical parts of it that you need to understand. So first, if you don't have the send that bit, which is the input bit here, right, the indicator here, it's like an enabling bit. If you don't have that one get enabled, you're not sending anything over. So only when send is one, you turn it on, right? Then you assign this um, zero, one, zero will be the first bit. If you look at the timing, I have to put it down first. 
So how do you put it down? So you just assign the LS, LSB a zero, right? For the data line, right? Just give a zero there. So the first uh, the first bit, which is LSB being sent out, will be will be zero, which means you put the uh, data line down to zero to start the communication. And the last, the MSB must be one because you just pull it up to one to stop the transmission when you're done. But in the middle, you sandwich the data in the middle. Um, so you pull it down, send the data, pull it up to finish the transmission. Okay. And this one, the TX data, which is a register here, is still 10 bit, it's the 10 bit data to host the starting bit and the ending bit and also the data in there okay so when you send it out one by one you follow a certain frequency see it's the so it's still the same same variable text data which is a 10 bit data okay you send it one by one by using an index here like it could be text data zero until text data nine to send it one by one to tx bit which is the one bit output here that's one thing you need to know, okay? A quick question here. So what is this zero doing here? What does this zero do? Start the transmission, what about one here? End the transmission, how, do, how could you tell? From the timing, right? Yeah, the first bit to be sent has to be zero because you have to put it down to zero to start the transmission. Okay. How many bits do you have for this timing gram? Uh, it's being indicated by this timing gram. How many bits you are sending? Hmm? 11. Yeah, it's including the starting and ending bits, right? And then including the parity bit and also plus eight bits of data, you have 11 bits. So how many bits do you have over here? So look at the the width of the data variable here. And counting these two bits, how many bits do you have for this module? Which one is missing? Yeah, so in that case, this transmitter doesn't have a parity bit. So the first example we created from um, here and being implemented to the IPGA board doesn't have a parity bit generator. Okay. And debounce module, we are pretty familiar with that. So you just directly reuse it. Don't modify it because we're already created. It's a digital block. You can directly grab and use. Just uh, include it into your top design. And here is the application of using this uh, transmit transmitting the TX module. So what we are going to do is um, think about that. So if your IPG has a has a TX in there, transmitting module, it is able to send data out from the from the uh, one liner, right? The one line of data transmitting uh, line here to somewhere, but it's not receiving since we don't have a receiving module here, right? So that's why if you look at the top module design, we can use a push button here on the IPGA board and we debounce it, okay? And then the TX module will be clocked by the 100 megahertz clock available on the board. We can use that one as a clock to time it. So what, what, what we are going to do is create a uh, string in here uh, I don't think it's a string, it's a register, it's a uh, constant being stored in the register. So starting with 4.1, it's a ASCII code, 4.1 is letter A, right? So we start with this byte, and when we push it, push button, we push once, we added one to it. So it's going to keep adding ones to this ASCII code, and the next letter will be B, letter B. You keep adding it, you keep adding to that constant. What's going to happen is if you look at the hex, the ASCII code here, 41 is. Wait, where's 41? Hmm? 
letter A, right, here. So four one is here. If you push the push button, it's going to add a 1 to it, it's going to show a B. So the data will be changed from A to B, and then C, E, so on and so forth. And eventually, what's going to happen is you are sending different constants, like bytes, that go up the code. Here, okay, so this data will be sent to here, will be available at this input for the TX module. And then your uh, UR TX module will be able to send all the single bits out to the TX line of the uh, USB port. Because there's a little chip converts the TX to USB, so we don't have to worry about that. It's super complicated. So we just imagine that the TX will be sent uh, to, to the computer through the USB port. So we have the USB port connected to the computer from the IPGA board, right? So the TX uh, module from the IPGA will be able to connect it to the USB port and then to the computer. So what's going to happen is the TX, the data here will be sent out to the serial monitor. You can open up the serial monitor. It could be Arduino serial monitor. It could be another like open source serial monitor. You can download from online. And when you are pushing the push button on the IPGA board, it's going to show these letters in your serial monitor. All right, and there's no Arduino involved, keep in mind. So it's just the IPGA and the push button, uh, your URTX module, and then the Arduino IDE, it's just the GUI, or just using the GUI to open up the serial port and display whatever has been sent or received by the computer through the uh, TX. Does that make sense? Okay. So the code is already provided, just let you guys play with it. Um, this this module is available here, all right. And the top module is here. So we do need the top module because we need to make the connections uh, between the buttons, the clock, and all the other things to the IPGA's uh, peripherals, and also giving a constant to it as well. Okay. Um, for the receiver, the the block looks like this. So you have to know the inputs and outputs. Have a clock, and the receiver's input pin from the data should be how many bits the input of the receiver module. How many bits do we have the in, uh, how many bits do we have for the input line of the receiver? I just want it. Because it's a serial, right? Just one. Just want to make sure you guys are still awake. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Serial line, you're receiving data out, uh, parity bit, ready, pin, error. Since you have a parity, if the parity is on, you can report the error. Mm -hmm. Jump in between different states. Um, Oh, we have what we haven't covered here is the ball rate. What's going to happen for the timing? So you'll probably have modified the ball rate, the body rate for the UART, the serial monitor. Usually we use 9600. Remember that? That's 9600 bits per second. Let me see if I can have that included in the. Oh, here. Uh, usually you change it to 9600 beats per second uh, but this is faster which is fine as long as your serial port uh, knows that okay so if you for example your arduino ide you set up 9600 then your hardware has to be 9600 at the same time in order to receive the correct uh, 
uh, character, uh, characters from the hardware. But now we define a different array, so I have to change it in your hardware, in your digital block, in IPGA. But the first example, the first example we use a push button um, to display a letter in the serial monitor that we used 9600 as a transmission rate for the serial communication. So in that case, we have to slow down our clock by doing this. And why this works for the purpose, for that purpose. So see, ball, uh, the body rate here is a counter. Is, I named it as a timer, but actually it's a counter here. Because you can see, it shows up here. When timer equals this counter, it's like count equals the count max that we used to do. Then we do something, right? So we know we already send out one bit. So how do we make sure that this count will make us uh, will make this transmission rate to be 9600 bits per second? So does this division make sense? So 100 megahertz, 100 megahertz is 100 mega cycles per second, right? That's 100 megahertz for the clock. If you are using this clock as a, a passing edge or the sensitivity list for the always statement, it's always at this frequency, which means we are having uh, this many cycles per second. So if you use this number divided by <laughs> Um, 9600 bits per second, we're getting to cancel all the seconds, so we're getting a hundred, um, we're getting 100 mega over 9600. Count per <clears throat> bits per bit, right. So we want to count until this number of count to send another bit. We have to wait to count to this many counts to send out another bit. So we can make sure that the transmission uh, frequency will be 9600 bits per second. So that's why we uh, have a division here. And then we are using this number as a count max. Okay. For the receiving, what this one does is um, we have a let's see because the Arduino serial monitor doesn't work really well, so I think for the receiving part, what I did is I used the open source online. Um, serial monitor, and you can even set up a parity uh, setting configuration here. So, for example, if I use the even parity uh, parity generator, then what's going to happen is the final, the received uh, um, data will have an even number of ones in there. So the receiver, because this this one is a sending, is a sender, so it's sending stuff to your IPGA. Um, so you have to design a, a even parity checker on IPGA. So what's going to happen is you can display all the bits including the data being received and the parity bit and the error bit and also the number of uh, number of data that you have received by far. So these ones can be implemented in your receiving code here, so we're all provided. Another thing you need to know is we haven't used this kind of statement before. So see, I included the URX, the re receiving module into this top module, and immediately I'm having this statement here. Okay. So what this one does is it's going to overwrite, it's going to overwrite or override the parameter, the first parameter in your sub module. So when you include it here, 
for example, we'll include this module here. If you have a parenthesis, you can have multiple parameters, parameters to be included in the parenthesis. So you can um, override the parameters in the sub module sequentially. But since we only have one uh, in the parenthesis, which means we, we are only override, overriding one parameter in the sub module, it's actually the first one. So if you come back to the receiver's module here, if you look at the statement, so the first parameter in the sub module is actually the body rate. So what that means is you don't really have to change the body rate in your receiving module, receiver module all the time. When you include it in the top module, you can override it. If you want to use a different body rate for the serial monitor, for the serial block, okay, you can do that. So even though I have a 9600 in the, in the receiving module, right, but when I include it into my top for the design, I can always change it. This is definitely faster, okay? Sometimes you need a faster transmission rate. That, that's how you can change it. And so for this, uh, I think the name is Tyra Terminal or whatever. So this serial monitor is different from the Arduino one, but you can, so we're going to use this one as a sender. So it's going to send um, the uh, letters to your um, IPGA. And here's the demonstration. So I typed one or two um, in the serial monitor on the computer and it is able to send it through the RX and TX, through the USB to the IPGA. And once it receives it, it's going to display the results um, on the LEDs. So one of the tasks will ask you to include a seven segment display to show the results instead of on, on LEDs. So right, I have the results, you just have, you just include a seven segment decoder and send the data over, it shouldn't be that difficult. So let's talk about the quiz really quick again, because um, just make sure you guys are, uh, you guys understand what's going on. So what I, what I'm trying to do is to display a second, the same image of the IPGA board, just next to the first one. And if you look at the VGA protocol, I think it's um, this one, okay? So this one displayed that image of the, of the board on the monitor, right? Like what you'll see in the video here, right? This one. Okay, so you have until Thursday, the end of the class. We don't have a lecture, but you have the time to work on it um, to get it done. So the result should be you have a second of the image without modifying the image file. Don't touch the image file, but display a second figure, the same figure just next to it. Okay, so we are not changing anything of the of the data file, but we are displaying another one just next to it. So if you look at the VGA module, this is where we should modify, okay? For here, we are only displaying one, one of the image on, on, a, on a monitor, so we are showing just the number of the width and length, I think uh, 80 and 80 by 80. It's a range. Um, if you want to display a wider, um, you know, range of the display, for example, what's happening should be, I think on the monitor should be like this. So, you, so for example, this is a monitor. And now what we are doing is we are displaying an image here, 80 by 80. So if you want to do another image with the same width, here we should at least assign 160 to xx and keep sy the same i think right i could be wrong but i'm just saying like <laughs> what may work right okay. and <clears throat> for for a part of the script over here if you see the age count is just the counts of the pixels, 
from the left to right and you can see the limit of this guy is um, 800 and here will be 525 for the HNV limit but whenever the counts you see it's using the same variable the um, whenever the counts falls into the range of the 80 by 80 it does something right otherwise it's just sign zero to it so that's why you see the rest of the screen is the rest of the monitor is just showing dark pixels instead of you know anything else all right so in that case we if we have a different range for s y and s x we will enable the other pixels here right so it's not showing the dark the black pixels anymore it's going to show something right so in that case we can show something there but what what should we do to to these assignments in order to show the different data points instead of you know the pure color pixels that's the question you have to answer during you know when you work on the quiz So what I was trying to do is, because I was looking at the data file, right? I was looking at it. It's just the line data. And starting with OF, you know, it's a A bit data file. That makes sense because we are reading a bit, you know, RGB data from it. So it's a the image file is an a bit um, image file. So every pixel will be resolved by a bits. That's why the quality of the bits are not really good. You see, the color of the board should be blue, but it's showing some like greenish color. Um, I so firstly I was thinking about if we can you know increase the resolution, but we have to modify the image file first, which will complicate things. So let's don't don't change anything to the data file. Still use uh, bytes for each pixel. If I scroll down, you can see it will start changing uh, to different colors, right? But they are all aligned in one column. It's just one column. So when the, all the pixels are being read from the uh, image file, I can see because it's a one dimension, Data file, just one line. That's why I, the the pixel address is not it's only one dimension as well. It's just adding one, keep adding one to it. So it's reading all the uh, pixel data file in in one column from the very top to the end. Um, but your program here will uh, tell this uh, where these pixels should be uh, should be placed in the monitor. What that happens is you. I think what happens is here um, for the monitor when it scans through all the pixels. So this is the data file, right? The dot coe file. Have all the data here. And this is the image file. So read the first pixel and assign the first one to it. And then going horizontally first because it's doing the H count first. So the H count is adding one until it reaches uh, the H count max, which is uh, H limit. Right? And then move to the next uh, row. So it's actually scanning from left to right and then from top to bottom. That's, a, that's the order of the scanning. So whenever it starts from here, is, but this one doesn't change the dimension it's just one dimension so just keep adding one to it so what that means is whenever it's over here it's assigning the first pixel to it the first data to the first pixel and the second one will get the second one and for the first 80 pixels we'll take all the 80 the first 80 data points from the image file and then you'll start with the second line and then you'll start from 81 to 160 right for the second row that's how that works, if I'm right. <laughs> we'll see by the end of the day, see if that works. If I add another one here, 
let's simplify it first. For example, it's not 1 to 80, it's 1, 2, 3, 4 for the image. Okay, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9, 10, 11, 12. For example, it's a 4 by 4. Okay, 4 by 4 image instead of 80 by 80. If we have another one here, the address of the pixels should be the same. Should be one, two, three, four, right? Should be the same. Yeah, let's just write it down. These are the numbers numbers of the uh, data points from the from the file. Okay. So in the code here, where should you modify to make it happen? So the original code doesn't change anything. It just keep adding one to it. It's linear. Just keep adding one to it. So you only have one column in the data file, right? But here it won't work because when you're adding one to it, it's one, two, three, four, it's going to work. But until here, so this should be one instead of five. If you just keep adding one to the address, it's going to show five instead of one. So I have to modify the address. All right? And the address should be associated with the H count because when you are counting to here, so H count will affect um, what address you should use. So I. But it won't be directly just sets back, but partially it is that principle. But you can see here it will be different. The second row, you have to take the, the V count in consideration. So if you have a V count, it's probably the multiples of V. For example, it, the second the second row, the first row should be fine because you are getting H count plus um these are fours, right? So four times V count. If V count starts with zero, so H count um, will not be affected because they are getting zeros. Um, so you are starting with from one again, right? If you move to the second row, uh, V count is one, okay? So this is five, this is four, okay? So when H count is uh, when H count is um, here, you want to minus, you want to use H count minus four, and then plus five, right? Yeah, I might be wrong. <laughs> well, but it, it makes sense. It's like the same count as the last Yeah. Yeah, just make sure this this works, right? So just make sure you have these counts instead of um, something else, All right? So the variables will be h count, v count, and address. See how you can make the right address in here. Okay. What's the reasonable time you think you can get this down? It will be like, for example, the you need a if statement here, right? So it's going to be if h count because h count is always from zero to one hundred sixty. Because whenever you move to the second row, h count is being re reset, so h count is always cycling through zero to one hundred sixty or one hundred fifty nine, right? Whenever it reaches the limit, it's going to reset it. No, I was wrong, sorry. So it's actually hitting here, right? It's hitting the, the maximum. The, the other end of the monitor is actually this one, 800, right? 800 minus one. 
that's the H count. Well, H count will keep going, keep moving. So in that case, we have to do everything within the range here, right? I have to think about it. How can we do it? We probably we probably have to use uh. You have two SXs, so like, um, you have two SXs, so like, um, oh, I guess you're right. You have two H counts. You don't want to have like a primary H count that mm -hmm. does scan across, yeah. and then another H count that relates to whatever your offset is. Yeah. Oh. That's the just, one that's like one from beginning of one to the end. Yeah. Or if you just had another SX. And then, so you have like an SX zero and an SX one. And then you have like an if H count is less than SX zero. Um, that's where we are found a lot of fire. Yes. Yeah. And then you have another SX, SX one, which is uh, like 160 yeah and then it says like if s or if uh h count is less than sx0 do mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. and if it's greater than sx0 but less than sx1 yes do this. Yeah. yeah that's what i did and just shift everything yes yeah, it's just, it's just there's some minor errors which you have to debug it right whenever i think it's going to work but it, usually it won't <laughs> Let's take some time to debug it. <laughs> All right. I think this will take you. This is 